Okay, so, so thank you, thank you very much. It's really a great uh, honor and, and pleasure to be here with so many uh, old friends. And so, so, so I want to uh, thank the, the director for the invitation, but uh, I also want to thank uh, COVID for getting out of the way at least momentarily. Uh, so uh, I want to discuss uh, uh, in the first lecture, I want to present my views on, uh, on the status of uh, Higgs naturalness. Uh, where we are, where we stand. So let me let me start taking one step back. Uh, how we got uh, how we got here. So so LAP was uh, uh, the high energy physics project that established the gauge principle in weak interactions. Now we give it the result for granted, but really LAP had a, had a huge impact in shaping our vision of the, the particle world. Uh, first of all, it taught us uh, the, the power of precision measurement as a way of uh, constraining uh, uh, new physics. Uh, in uh, 1994, uh, the electroweak uh, fit of lab data predicted the, the top mass, uh, 177, uh, where the first error is experimental, the second uh, is due to the Higgs mass uncertainty. And a month later, uh, CDF uh, announced uh, the possible existence of the top with a mass of 176 uh, uh, plus minus 10. So, so we, within a year, both CDF and D0 reached the five sigma, signif five sigma significance uh, that meant uh, uh, discovery. Uh, at the end of the, of the lab program, the electroweak fits constrained the Higgs mass in the range between 115 and 285, with a best fit of uh, 129. Uh, the scan of the, of the Z pole, uh, of, the, of the cross section of the Z pole, predicted the number of neutrinos and the precision with extraordinary precision, which is not just a mere curiosity, but really carries very important information about possible uh, new invisible particles. So uh, uh, lab data are really a mine of information about uh, virtual physics. Uh, moreover, uh, lab data expose that uh, the gauge uh, symmetry of weak interaction is spontaneously broken. We learn this by, by combining the information from the gauge structure of the interactions and the existence of longitudinal components of the W and Z mass, of the, of that, of the W and the Z, and, uh, and the masses uh, for, uh, for the vector bosons. So from this, uh, we could conclude that propagating particles don't share the full symmetry of interaction. In other words, that electroweak symmetry is spontaneously broken. Uh, that was the result of, of, of LAP. However, the story was not over because LAP didn't give us the final answer about the UV completion of the spontaneously broken uh, theory. We knew that the electroweak interactions were described by a nonlinear uh, Lagrangian of, 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 of this form, and uh, the Lagrangian is non renormalizable, signal, signaling a, a breakdown of uh, perturbative unitarity and therefore the emergence of, uh, of new physics. So some new phenomenon had to occur below the TV scale, uh, although experiment could, could not tell us what, and this was the, the, the lab legacy. Then came LHC and he gave us the answer to the question about uh, uh, UV completion. And the, 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 the simplest solution was the right one. Uh, just add one uh, scalar to the longitudinal components of the W and Z and form a weak doublet, problem solved. Uh, uh, the Higgs mass was right where it was expected from lab precision measurements. And, uh, and then uh, the LHC also continued the lab precision program. And this was really largely uh, a surprise. Uh, the LHC, has uh, proved that hadron colliders can be precision machines. Uh, precision measurements can be made for uh, cross sections, uh, kinematical distributions, uh, parameter extraction. And here I'm showing some, some really striking example of this, uh, of this kind of precision. Um, uh, incidentally, 
uh, you know that, uh, that the CDF has recently announced a new extraction of the W mass, which is seven sigma of the standard model pre precision. However, the situation is still very controversial to say the least. But the, the, the precision program is one of the most important legacies of the LHC. And this result could not have been anticipated at the time uh, the LHC uh, started and was possible only because of the successful uh, interplay between different sectors, right? The, the, the exceptional accelerator performance, uh, uh, detector resolutions, uh, uh, high performance computing and data handling, higher order theoretical uh, prediction of the, of, the, uh, of the processes and various technological development. And this led to uh, unprecedented precision in standard model processes and even to new searches beyond traditional frontiers. So uh, has the LHC spoken the last uh, a word on, on electroweak braking? Well, not really. Uh, first of all, we have tested uh, the Higgs uh, only at a superficial level, and we must probe its, its inner, inner structure. Roughly speaking, the, the present sensitivity on Higgs coupling is at, let's say, roughly 10% level for the W and Z gauge boson and 20% for the third generation quarks and leptons. This is an important result, but it's not sufficient to probe convincingly the nature of the Higgs boson. Just to get a feel for this number, let me define the degree of compositeness of a particle as the size of its structure in units of its uh, Compton wavelength, which is, which is a measure of its quantum size. Right. So for the proton, I find that this ratio of compositeness is, is about one. And this is in perfect agreement with the notion that the proton is indeed a fully composite object. Uh, for a pion to do the same exercise, uh, you, 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 you find uh, a value of three, 10 to the minus two, which is reasonable because the pion is a composite particle, but also emerges as a Goldstone boson below the uh, QCD, QCD scale. So in that in a sense, it's a, it's a hybrid. Now, if I want to compare it with the Higgs, so with today's precision, we have tested the degree of compositeness of the Higgs up to the level of 10 to the minus two. This means that the Higgs boson could be as composite as a pion without experiment having noticed anything special. So, Really, they, this is, uh, uh, clearly shows a need for better measurement and future precision program can test uh, this compositeness parameter at the level of 10 to the minus three. Uh, it is fair to say that uh, the, the LHC result had really a revolutionary impact on theoretical physics because they, they really forced us to think differently about uh, particle physics. And this has to do with uh, one question that is left uh, unanswered by, by the LHC, and it is uh, Higgs naturalness, and this is what uh, I want to uh, talk about. The problem is well known, right? In a, in, a, in a quantum field theory, quantum corrections push mass parameters at the maximum value allowed by asymmetry. So I think that uh, by now the, 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 the problem is well known, well understood, although, uh, I can still, we can still hear a completely wrong statement uh, here and there. Uh, a statement like uh, uh, naturalness depends uh, on the regularization process or on probability measures, on arbitrary aesthetic criteria. Is, is no longer a problem because the LHC didn't discover new particles and so on. I mean, I, I don't think I need to, to get into details and explain why these statements are idiotic, but uh, feel free to ask uh, if you want uh, uh, explanations. Uh, naturalness uh, is, a, is a powerful tool provided by quantum field theory to explore the properties of a theory beyond the boundaries of what has been tested experimentally. It enters the game when, when some parameters of your effective theory are very sensitive to the heavy modes that you have integrated up. And uh, 
And then this gives you information about the maximum energy up to which you can extrapolate your low energy description. It's a, it's a kind of, a, it's an alarm bell uh, that your description is, is incomplete. So let me give you some, uh, some examples. So the first example is uh, the self energy of the, of the electron. So if you do a simple exercise, uh, just treat the electron as a classical object, classical sphere, charged sphere, and you compute the electrostatic uh, uh, energy, which goes like alpha or divided by R, R is the size, and you require that this electrostatic energy has to be smaller than rest mass of the, uh, the, 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 the energy, the self energy of the, of the electron, which is equal to the, to the, to the, to the rest mass multiplied by, by C squared. And then you find, uh, uh, you find a cutoff of 70 MeV. You can, do a, you can get a better bound if you assume that uh, since the electron you know as a spin, you still treat it as a classical sphere, but you make it rotate. And so this gives a magnetic energy. You compute the magnetic energy that goes like one over R cubed, and you again you 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 uh, you you require that it's uh, uh, smaller than the mass of the electron, and you get uh, that the cut, the UV cutoff is a three MeV. Uh, if you do the exercise in quantum mechanics, this is uh, very well known. You do the loop diagram, you find a cutoff of six MeV. Well, this is uh, this is indeed you know that there is some new physics coming uh, coming that regulates all these divergences. And this is uh, uh, the positron, which indeed uh, is not far from uh, that bound. Uh, same thing for the pi on mass difference. If you just compute uh, uh, that loop diagram, so the electrostatic uh, uh, contribution to the mass difference, and you require that is smaller than the, uh, than the experimental value, you find that the cutoff has to be smaller than 850 MeV. And indeed, you know that there is new physics that regulates it. And this new physics is, uh, uh, you take the, the, the mass of the rho, which is uh, just below the value. Another example is a classic example of the chaos mass difference. You do the same game. This time is a little bit more sophisticated. You, have to, you don't have even to compute the diagram. You just uh, do look at the power counting and you know what the parameters that come in. And uh, you find uh, that the, 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 the new physics has to come before 2 GeV. And indeed, the, 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 the charm is uh, uh, just above 1, one GeV. Actually, the, the, while the two previous examples were, in a sense, post addictions, because uh, the naturalness argument was not, was not used at the time, neither for the positron nor for the dronic resonances. On the other hand, this example is really historically accurate because uh, this is how the charm was uh, uh, predicted. Uh, the, we, the, at that time, the, not, the, the word naturalness was not used, but it's exactly that, the same argument. So if the same argument is, is now made for the, for the Higgs mass, the alarm bell of naturalness tells you that new physics should take place uh, below about 500 GeV. And when the alarm bell goes off, the obvious next, next step is to look for the missing piece, which is what was historically was done previously. And, uh, and so for this new physics that accounts for naturalness. And what happened? Well, we, we, we did look, but uh, there is uh, no indication. So what happens when you don't find these uh, missing pieces? And of course, uh, this is far from a hypothetical question because uh, uh, the indications that we receive from the LHC is that we haven't seen that physics uh, even well above that scale. Uh, well, you know, uh, in the case uh, in the case that uh, uh, when when you don't find indication, one has to question the hypothesis on which the principle rests. In this case, uh, naturalness, and then see what are the consequences of dropping this hypothesis. So let me, let me analyze the hypothesis on which naturalness uh, uh, is based and see what happens when these hypotheses uh, do not hold. Well, the first uh, hypothesis is uh, scale separation. So the framing of the problem of naturalness is based on the existence of multiple energy scales, well separated. 
right? If you, if you take the standard model in isolation as a, as a renormalizable theory, you can't even formulate the problem because there's no hierarchy of scales to, to start with, right? So new scales appear at the quantum level in that case, as for instance, in the, in the case of, uh, for, for, of for the Landau pose. So the question is, uh, are there any new energy scales above the weak scale? Well, we don't know the answer, but I think that we have uh, good reasons uh, uh, to uh, believe uh, uh, to believe that the most plausible uh, answer is yes. Uh, quantum gravity has a scale associated uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the Planck constant. It's not, uh, it's not, a, uh, it's, it's not a, a mass scale, but uh, it's, uh, it's very plausible that at that, at that mass scale, there are uh, heavy modes. Uh, other indications come from uh, neutrino masses, a strong CP, inflation, gauge coupling unification. None of them is indisputable evidence, but they provide uh, uh, strong indications uh, for the existence of new, very heavy uh, modes. More in general, if you, if you want to understand and compute any of those uh, 28 free parameters that enter the standard model, it seems unavoidable to introduce uh, new skills. So while we have uh, uh, strong reasons to, to, to believe that new short distance uh, uh, skills must exist, we have to keep in mind that this is not guaranteed. And uh, for instance, uh, this hypothesis was challenged by large extra dimensions, which try to bypass naturalness by postulating that there is no scale separation in the real world. Or by theories uh, based on the idea of asymptotic uh, safety in, in quantum gravity. But the, the, the lack of any mass uh, scale above uh, the, the weak scale is, uh, is a very ambitious assumption because it is hard to reconcile the, the, the idea of no scale separation with the real world, unless you're willing to, to renounce, to find any explanation for the structure of the parameters of the standard model. So I, I don't think that this is a very uh, fruitful uh, way of thinking. So in conclusion, personally, I don't see uh, good reasons to challenge hypothesis one. So let me come to hypothesis two. EFT validity. So the, the naturalness principle relies heavily on the effective theory approach of quantum field theory. Uh, basically boils down to uh, the quantum mechanical effect of parameters being sensitive to heavy modes integrated out from the low energy theory. And so when the sensitivity is very strong, it violates the Wilsonian intuition of EFT. So the, 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 the question is, uh, could it be that the rules of effective field theory break down? This would be really a revolutionary result because for centuries, I mean, since, since the beginning of, of science, I would say uh, progress uh, was possible in physics exactly because natural phenomena can be described layers by layers, uh, separating. You don't need the full knowledge to, in order to derive the, 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 the motion of the planets uh, or, uh, or the structure of the atom. So science uh, uh, made the uh, progress uh, because uh, 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 to, to solve a physics problem, you don't need to have the full complete knowledge at all scales. So short distance uh, information can be encoded uh, in a few uh, free parameters uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the effective uh, field theory. Uh, we have uh, become uh, accustomed uh, uh, of, uh, uh, to the result that we can give a consistent uh, physical description within a certain energy range without the full knowledge of physics at arbitrary constant, at, at, at arbitrary uh, scale. But uh, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, not guaranteed, okay? 
it's not guaranteed that uh, that uh, a nature satisfies the effective field theory hypothesis. Uh, um, uh, in uh, there, there, there is a possibility that uh, uh, that there could be some uh, interplay between uh, phenomena at uh, short and long long distances, and this would be really a complete revolution with our approach to understand uh, uh, particle physics and the physical world uh, more in general. So this may sound really crazy, but there are some intriguing indications that actually may not be completely crazy. Because uh, take the example of, uh, of gravity. We're used to, to think that uh, uh, high energy means uh, short distance, uh, because with uh, 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 higher energies, you can probe deeper uh, uh, inside the inner structure of, of matter. But now gravity does not work that way because uh, if you increase the energy of, of, of the scattering of two particles, and then when you go above the, 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 the Planck scale, you start forming a black hole. And its horizon, uh, the, the, the Schwarzschild radius, uh, um, grows with the energy that you inject. And so, and so that hides uh, 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 the, the, a region of space. And uh, the bigger the energy, uh, the bigger the, uh, the Schwarzschild radius. This means that as we increase the scattering energy, we get less and less information about short distance, exactly the opposite of normal intuition. So gravity really seems to lead the possibility of an infrared UV interplay. And indeed, there is another indication that effective field theory may not be able to catch the full physics story, even, you know, in, even in the low energy domain. And, and this is a swampland uh, conjecture. These various swampland conjectures state that not all theories that are allowed by the usual rules of effective field theory, symmetry, selection rule, necessarily have a consistent UV completion in the context of, uh, of quantum gravity. There could be uh, some uh, uh, restrictions of the infrared theory that are completely inexplicable from a low energy point of view. Of course, this is not sufficient to say that, uh, that IRUV connections are possible, but it exposes the limitation of thinking only in terms of, uh, of low energy theory. And uh, 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 showing a, a breakdown of, uh, of EFT in, in particle physics really would be revolutionary, a complete revolution of, uh, of our understanding of particle physics. It's so revolutionary that we don't even know how to formulate uh, a concrete example of uh, how this can happen, okay? Uh, uh, this would require some, some magic uh, uh, interplay between IR and UV, in, uh, introducing some correlations uh, such that uh, uh, the total uh, quantum correction to IR parameter is smaller than the single contribution that comes from the EV, from the uh, UV. And, uh, and so uh, this, this magic uh, correlation between IR and UV is really something that completely defies the EFT uh, logic. Uh, however, more and more we start finding that uh, this may, uh, there are pot potential examples that this magic phenomenon could appear but it really may also mean a breakdown of, uh, of uh, some of their basic ideas of quantum field theory, in particular locality, it will, could be uh, broken. Uh, so I find this idea extremely fascinating, but we're still very far from, uh, from getting uh, close uh, to reality. Let me just give you one example. It's, uh, it's, I, I find it's an interesting example of a possible IR-UV mixing. And this is uh, the, the, the Cohen-Kaplan-Nelson bound. So uh, consider 
consider a box of volume uh, L cube. And uh, according to quantum field theory, the number of degrees of freedom uh, grows like the volume of the box. Uh, therefore, the entropy of the quantum field theory system uh, has to go like uh, L cube, uh, uh, lambda cube, where lambda is the UV cutoff. However, the entropy uh, cannot exceed, uh, when you go to gravity, cannot exceed the maximum entropy of the box, which is given by the Bekenstein uh, uh, black hole entropy. So this uh, implies uh, uh, a bound on the size of the, of the, of the box, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, the L has to be smaller than MP squared divided by lambda Q. Therefore, no, the interesting thing is that now the IR cutoff, which is the size of the box, uh, cannot be chosen independently of the UV cutoff. So there is an IR UV interplay, and this is really strange, right? When you work with lattice gauge theories, you, you, you put freely, you use uh, your UV cutoff does not depend on the size of the lattice that you consider. Actually, it is even possible to derive a, a stronger bound by arguing that all states whose Schwarzschild radius is larger than the box just simply make uh, uh, the system collapse because they form a black hole. Therefore, the, the maximum energy states must have uh, a, a Schwarzschild radius smaller than the size of the box. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, the energy density of those states is lambda to the four, and therefore the total energy is uh, uh, L cube lambda to the four. And requiring that the corresponding Schwarzschild radius is smaller than the size of the box implies L equal is, is, must be smaller than M Planck divided by uh, lambda squared. Now, this is a stronger bound than the previous one. Why is it interesting? Because if I take the, uh, the IR cutoff, it means the size of the box, to be equal to the Hubble radius, that means I, I, I'm taking the all observable universe as my box, one finds that the UV cutoff must be smaller than 10 to the minus 3 EV. And uh, as you know, this is approximately the value that corresponds to the uh, cosmological constant. So, of course, there's no be solid uh, basis for this bound, but it's an interesting example if we had a theory that explains uh, uh, why, why is it coming from, uh, is an example of an IR UV mixing, okay? Because uh, the two cutoffs, which in principle you would think they are completely unrelated, in reality, they are not independent, but uh, uh, they have to satisfy uh, an inequality. In conclusion, I say that exploring the possibility of dropping this hypothesis is a, is a very interesting adventure and there are lots of people nowadays uh, trying to pursue this. However, it's a very, also a very difficult road uh, because it really requires blowing apart some of the founding principles of uh, quantum field theory. So you have to go beyond quantum field theory. You have to go to uh, quantum gravity. High risk, high, gray, high, high gain. Uh, I think this is an uh, interesting direction for people with uh, uh, great ambitions. Well, let me now consider uh, hypothesis number three. Uh, IR free parameters are calculable quantities in the UV completion. This is, of course, a, a central hypothesis of the naturalness principle. Whenever you formulate the question about the naturalness of the Higgs, you tacitly assume that the Higgs mass is a calculable quantity in a more fundamental theory. So take examples of theory in which you can compute that mass. Uh, take supersymmetry. The, the Higgs mass is, uh, is given by a combination of the mass parameter that breaks supersymmetry and those that break a chiral symmetry. And this is not surprising because uh, the Higgs mass is protected by, by those uh, two symmetries combined together. So, so either 
uh, uh, there is a special and unexpected relation between the UV and the IR. And this is breaking, it would be a, a breakdown of hypothesis two, the, the one that I was discussing before, or the mass parameters that control the relevant symmetries cannot be much larger than uh, the Higgs mass itself. And this is the usual uh, statement uh, of uh, nature. Uh, the story is, uh, is the same for composite Higgs. The, the, the Higgs mass, is when it's computed, is, is a loop factor below the scale of the uh, new resonances. And, and here I'm taking the, the top Yukawa coupling as a source of the breaking of the shift symmetry, because usually it's the largest coupling that comes in. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this breaks the symmetry that protects the Higgs as an exact uh, Goldstone Bose. So again, either there is a, a magic IR-UV connection uh, or naturalness implies that new strong dynamics uh, is uh, uh, to be found below the, the weak scale. Now, the question is, uh, uh, how can I give up uh, this uh, hypothesis uh, number three? Well, one uh, trivial way uh, to say is uh, the following. Uh, say the Higgs mass is, uh, is not a calculable uh, uh, quantity. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a God-given number and knowing its origin goes uh, beyond uh, human comprehension. Okay, this is uh, a possible uh, attitude uh, which is often uh, uh, present in blocks, but uh, I don't think it's a very scientific attitude uh, because we have learned that uh, nature is comprehensible and the role of physics is exactly to discover its law. So just stating that X mass is, is what it is, is not a particularly meaningful uh, statement. However, there is a more interesting way in which hypothesis uh, three uh, could break down. And uh, this is uh, the case uh, in which uh, the IR parameter does not correspond to a unique expression in terms of UV quantities, but is a, is a function of some field whose value varies during the cosmological history or throughout uh, some, some complex vacuum structure realized uh, in, the, in, in the universe by, by, by your theory. So this point of view is uh, a profound paradigm change with respect to the usual approach based on, on symmetry. And, uh, and uh, uh, some people have a little sympathy for this approach because they see it as, as a way of renouncing to attack fundamental physics problems, uh, a way of deferring uh, the question of computing uh, uh, physical parameters. But, uh, but I really believe that this is absolutely not true. It's, it's, it's exactly the opposite. This is a, a radical change in perspective, but it's deeply rooted in physical theories and gives a description of physical reality that can lead to precise uh, predictions. Uh, so for me, this, uh, this direction is very intriguing. And uh, also this direction is pursued by many people and offers a, a wide range of uh, possibilities. Uh, uh, still largely uh, unexplored. And I will uh, present uh, uh, one of these possibility in my uh, second lecture uh, to, to tomorrow. So uh, at this moment, uh, let, me, let me summarize for a second what I said. So naturalness is a powerful tool for extrapolating our knowledge beyond the boundaries or what is explored by experiment and infer the scale where a certain effective uh, field theory must break down. And uh, I gave you several examples in which it is indeed possible to derive uh, successful predictions out of that. The point that I made is that's like uh, just for every principle in, in physics, the naturalness principle relies on certain hypotheses. Uh, what I've shown is that uh, giving up naturalness by relaxing one of these hypotheses is possible, 
but it often leads to consequences that are even more radical than those of naturalness itself. It may really lead to a true change of paradigm. And this is, for me, the revolutionary legacy of the LHC result. Uh, the uh, conventional road to naturalness led to amazing concepts in, in physics, uh, technicolor, supersymmetry, composite Higgs. They imply new particles, new types of forces, new symmetry structure, a new vision of, of space time in some cases, like in supersymmetry. And these are grand ideas, but are based uh, on an approach that I'd like to define conservative in the sense that it is an extension of the successful approach that led to the standard model. And let me call uh, uh, this approach the symmetry paradigm because gauge symmetry of a Lagrangian played the role of an underlying principle uh, uh, which, 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 is, which lies in, in this, this approach. And, uh, and this paradigm has dominated uh, uh, physics for the last 50 years and has led to extraordinary uh, uh, successes. Um, in, uh, uh, essentially, that gave us the, the conviction that we had a structure. And the structure was the fundamental ingredient was uh, gauge symmetry. And when you apply to, uh, to space-time coordinates, you get gravity. When you apply to internal coordinates, the fields, you get uh, the standard model. Then, because of naturalness, we knew that the standard model had to go through one step, which maybe just by extending symmetry could have been supersymmetry or could have been a technicolor, maybe then leading to gut. And then all these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, different roads would get together to, uh, to the two super strings that give, would give a final uh, unification. Uh, so then uh, we had a structure. It was just a matter of filling details. Like what we, we thought from the theory point of view, what we had was to uh, solve string theory and, uh, and, uh, and obtain then the low energy theory. For experiment, the task was to discover what is that step, what is the extension that you need of the standard model at the weak scale. And with these two elements, then it was just a matter of connecting the dots, of filling the details, and obtaining the final theory as the only logical possibility. And by the way, along, along the way, once you have this theory, you solve the various existing problems uh, like, uh, like uh, dark matter, because maybe there are some particles that uh, explain inflation. There is a particle that plays the role of the inflaton, strong CP, the axion is the ideal solution, flavor, because of the level of strings, you have a certain vacuum structure that determines uh, uh, all the various uh, parameters. Well, so the conceptual structure was there, was just a matter of filling the details. Well, it didn't work out that way, as you know, uh, because, uh, because uh, 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 the, the, uh, the, 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 the known discovery of, uh, of, of, of new physics at the LHC may be a clue that uh, the paradigm the symmetry paradigm is running out of gas. It may be a clue that gauge symmetries are, should not be taken as the initial element, as uh, they were not as fundamental as we thought, but they may be just an emergent phenomenon as we have uh, examples of, of this. They could be so a kind of a, of, a, of a mirage of a different reality that takes place at a more fundamental level. So maybe, the uh, LHC, uh, what is, uh, what is uh, telling you is that it's not just a matter of uh, adapting our models or adjusting some parameters, but it's really time to look for radically different paradigms. And uh, uh, maybe 
it, it may our our all the conceptual structure is may show some signs of of, of of decline and maybe we are facing a breakdown of uh, of reductionism because reduction is based on the logic of effective uh, field theory so actually although symmetry is a corner stone of uh, of physics one may already see some signs of decline in the concept of symmetry as we try to make one further step. And this is the swampland uh, conjectures that is showing that the global symmetries are, are never exact, uh, and uh, but they must be violated by quantum gravity. So they're not a, a fundamental element. And gauge symmetries are not even symmetries, right? Because they, 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 they act trivially on the, on the, Hilbert, uh, on the Hilbert space. Right. A, a gauge transformation is not a transformation between different uh, uh, physical states, uh, but uh, only an expression of the redundancy of our parameterization. This is why, you know, every time to, to, to our students, very often we show the Mexican hat and we just fool them all the time by making them believe that there are many vacuum when in reality there are, there is only one. Um, uh, so it could be uh, uh, it could be that uh, uh, the gauge symmetry are an emergent phenomenon and not a defining principle. Uh, uh, symmetries alone could not be sufficient to determine the low energy theories, and and therefore other principles uh, may be needed. Uh, 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 anomaly cancellation is a familiar example, right, of, of, of cases in which you do not get them uh, only from the, from the low energy uh, theory. Uh, the, the weak uh, gravity conjecture, the swampland are providing all kinds of, uh, of examples. Uh, and uh, and we, we are finding more and more constraints uh, which could not be derived from low energy theories by studying the properties of analyticity, unitarity, crossing, and Lorentz symmetries. Uh, du dualities. Uh, uh, dualities are, are often a sign that your descriptions is not adequate to catch the, the content of physical reality. This is, think, a case of, uh, of, of quantum mechanics, right? I mean, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, neither the language of particle nor the language of, of wave was the appropriate language. And so we had to uh, use this duality between these two just to deal with the situation. But, uh, uh, but uh, this may indicate that a different uh, formulation is uh, needed. Uh, so, so maybe one has to go beyond the usual uh, Lagrangian description. And uh, this is what, uh, for instance, uh, uh, gravity gauge uh, duality is uh, telling you. Uh, um, and uh, new directions are explored and very interesting uh, connections are found. And uh, for instance, with the tensor networks or quantum information bringing you know, fields of, from uh, uh, quantum optics to quantum information relating to uh, to, to the high energy physics and, uh, and, and quantum gravity. Um, then uh, there is uh, another clue that speaks in favor of a paradigm change, and this is a cosmological constant. From uh, an effective uh, uh, field theory point of view, the problem of the cosmological constant is really identical to the one of the Higgs mass. They, uh, they are the first two terms of the expansion of an effective potential in powers of the, of the field. Uh, the, the, the only difference is that the cosmological constant is not an observable in the quantum, quantum field theory, but becomes an observable only when you turn on gravity. But this is classical gravity. So, so I don't see any substantial uh, logical difference unless something magical happens at the level of quantum gravity that we shall perform. And uh, it is uh, uh, fair to say that 
that uh, all the various attempts uh, to explain the smoothness of the cosmological constant using the symmetry paradigm have not led to any decisive uh, progress. And uh, on the other hand, you may like it or not, but uh, Weinberg's anthropic approach gives a, a logically consistent and conceptually simple uh, framework. And uh, it's based uh, on uh, uh, the multiverse. And for me, this is uh, the really fundamental aspect of uh, uh, Weinberg's remark, not the use of anthropic uh, uh, arguments, but bringing the idea of the multiverse in the arena of fundamental physics. And uh, I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, thinking in terms of multiverse is withdrawing from finding physical explanation. On, on the contrary, right? So it's a way of redesigning uh, physical reality, uh, the structure of the vacuum, the history of the, of the universe, and its effects are basic understanding of the principles governing, governing the, 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 the universe. It's a, it's a kind of a, of a new uh, Copernical uh, revolution since you know, every, uh, so even the patch of the universe we live in is not special. Uh, it's, a, it's a revision of the, uh, of the cosmological principle right? because uh, the universe uh, is approximately homogeneous and isotropic only in our vicinity, only within our horizon, but then globally is uh, largely uh, non-homogeneous. Uh, the, so in a sense, it's, it's really the result is, uh, this is the time that I have left, eight minutes, is I, that my correct, correct? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the, the, the message that we receive from string theory is that there is a huge number of outcomes uh, depending on circumstances, not depending on fundamental principles. And the message that we receive from cosmology is that inflation is likely to be in a quantum regime. Why do I say that? Because we, from the measurement, from Kobe, we know that the inflaton potential has to be relatively, actually very flat. And if you have a dynamical evolution of a field in a, in a very flat uh, uh, potential, the, the quantum fluctuation will tend to dominate over the classical behavior. So you are dominated by, by quantum fluctuation, you are dominated uh, by an eternal inflation uh, regime. And this, these two elements put together uh, give you the, 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 the multiverse. I want to stress that the, 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 the multiverse is not a hypothesis, but it's a consequence of some physical theories. So if you uh, accept the hypothesis, you must accept uh, the consequences according to uh, the, um, um, to the scientific method. And uh, it's clear that the, these ideas are complete breakdown of EFT and reductionism. Uh, but just think that even before you introduce the, uh, the, the, the multiverse, you understand that the moment you introduce inflation, there is something going on in the exchange of scales. Think of just the, the, the origin of the large scale structures in, in cosmology, right? The, the origin is given by the, 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 the structure are, are, uh, originate from quantum fluctuations, a primordial quantum fluctuation of the inflaton field, which are then stretched to astronomical size. And you see that uh, here we have quantum mechanics that acts on the size of the universe. So we have, uh, we have completely changed the usual logic of uh, separation of scales. The multiverse, when you go to eternal inflation, pushes this to yet uh, another, another step. So it is the closest you can get to the Copernican uh, principle. Let me explain why. I mean, is the, uh, is the, uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is a multiverse uh, so odd? Uh, so the, the usual picture that we get from standard inflation is that the universe uh, in the early stage has to be uh, absolutely 
uh, uh, just empty space filled only with vacuum energy, but nothing else, and uh, almost uh, perfectly uh, uniform, almost because up to quantum correction. The multiverse instead gives you a dynamical structure which is in constant evolution, where new universes are eternally created. There's a creation of matter. So the, the, the Big Bang is, is uh, where the, 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 the instant when you have the creation of matter is not a special event and a single event, but only a generic episode of a story that continues. Now, uh, I find uh, that uh, this picture is much more in line with the Copernical uh, principle and what we know about nature. We know, look in this room, that nature is complex in its manifestation. And yet we also know that in spite we're all different, we're all, we look uh, different, we are dressed different, we think differently, and yet we're all made of quarks and electrons. So there is a, a, a fundamental simplicity hidden in the complexity. And yet nature in its manifestation is uh, complex. And uh, so why, I ask, uh, should the nature behave differently when we are talking about the entire universe and the entire universe should be instead this perfectly simple structure? Personally, I, I, I see I'm much more attracted by, by a more complex uh, uh, structure. Um, the, uh, uh, so then uh, there's also this objection that I hear sometimes is uh, the multiverse is non-scientific because, uh, uh, because it describes a reality which is beyond observation. Uh, I answer that uh, the multiverse describes physical reality, okay? It does, it not, does not uh, describe imaginary reality, but it's a reality beyond the cosmic horizon. Is that so strange? Now, let me make a, a very uh, paradoxical maybe, but just, a, just an example. The Higgs boson, is the Higgs boson observable? I mean, everybody in this room would say yes, right? But can you really see a Higgs boson? The Higgs boson lives for 10 to the minus 22 seconds. Now, I, I, I cannot even conceive an electronic which would be able to see it. Why do we see that uh, we can see the Higgs boson? The reason is that we just simply detect some electronic signals and presumably they are coming from particles that are produced in the Higgs in the decay. So the point is that when we deal, and this is just an example, but you can think of many, when we deal to physics at the edge of knowledge, the experimental confirmation does not lie in the observation of the phenomenon, but in the, in the identification of the consequences. This is true for every experiment in particle physics. What about the quark, okay? So the, and this is true also for phenomena in astronomy. So what we do is that we trust the scientific method and therefore we derive physical laws and we extrapolate and we, we know because we can trust that we extrapolate even in a regime in which we cannot see directly, okay? So in the same way as we will never see directly uh, time intervals which are so small, or we will never be able to see a quark, we, we, we claim that we do because we do, we, we, we trust the consequences. And this is exactly the, the same thing. I see that uh, uh, time uh, is uh, a little bit uh, running out of time. So let me, let me sort of uh, get to, to conclusion. So they, uh, the, the, the results from the LHC really had an explosive effect on, uh, on theoretical particle physics. And uh, now we, have, uh, we are facing this alternative. Either uh, the symmetry paradigm is, is correct. So that picture that I was drawing is correct. We are just missing 
some, uh, some of the details. And uh, in that case, the LHC tomorrow will make uh, discoveries, or we are really facing a completely different uh, uh, alternative. And these alternatives uh, really require big uh, changes in uh, the paradigms, in the basics of what, the way we think in terms of uh, quantum field theory. Uh, I'm getting to my conclusions, okay? So uh, I have uh, a lot more that I will skip because of lack of time. Uh, again, I just, just, I just I wanna recall this, that you, know, you may think that the explanation in terms of multiverse are odd. Well, you use it all the time. The axiom is exactly an explanation of that kind. Because when you say that the axion solves the CP, the axion in the early universe creates varies in the, in the universe and creates various patches, which then are relaxed because of symmetry to zero. So that is uh, an example of, uh, of a multiverse in quantum field theory, which is very familiar to all of you because the axion uh, is uh, zero. Well, we don't know if the axion is true, but uh, it's certainly uh, a familiar uh, object. So let me, why change, why doesn't change? Uh, let me just conclude. And, uh, okay. So let me get to my, to my conclusions. Um, uh, we can imagine renouncing uh, uh, naturalness by dropping some of the hypotheses. However, the consequences of doing so are even more radical than those of naturalness itself. Uh, the uh, LHC uh, results are having a gigantic impact on theoretical particle physics. And we're really confronted now with uh, new uh, directions and possibly some conceptual uh, revolutions. Uh, and uh, and uh, tomorrow, I will uh, give you one example of, uh, of this, uh, which, uh, which is uh, uh, called uh, self-organized localization. Stop here. Thank you. Questions, comments? Uh, hi, th thank you very much. Uh, so you, uh, you uh, very broadly, you uh, you describe two possible ways in which effective field theory could break down. One is in uh, uh, gravity, uh, where you would have a UVIR mixing, uh, presumably, and the other is sort of cosmological time evolutionary situations, which would lead to the multiverse. Uh, so I just wanted to know what your own uh, preference is. It is it that you think the answer, I mean, and it could be that the cosmological constant has an explanation in one and the Higgs in the other, uh, or, uh, or both could be from a cosmological multiverse origin, or uh, what is your- uh... at, the moment, at the moment, all options are open. And uh, is really, this is really in the infancy. It's like, uh, you know, the beginning of quantum mechanics when people started to having some clues, but they didn't have the Schrodinger equation. They didn't have uh, uh, Heisenberg uh, uh, non-commutative algebra. And, uh, and so they were just uh, trying to figure it out. We are at that stage, okay? So uh, I can't even say what I prefer. Certainly I am uh, uh, emotionally attracted by this idea of a big change, whatever it is. I mean, both the, the, the the, the examples that you described are, are big changes because uh, it means uh, giving up our paradigm of, of symmetry, of gauge symmetries as uh, the, 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 the initial element. So I think any of those would be fantastic uh, for, for the future. So I think that, you know, comparing to the beginning of quantum mechanics, uh, I think that it's a, it's a very exciting moment. Uh, uh, but uh, not for me, I'm too old. I think it's an exciting 
a moment for young people. Uh, indeed, quantum mechanics were done by people in the 20s or early 30s, right? Uh, because they had the courage of uh, throwing away some of the principles that seemed uh, uh, they could not even be discussed. And uh, they went all the way and they received uh, uh, a lot of criticism and violent criticism from the older generation. So it is a, it is a risky, but uh, very exciting moment. Uh, but uh, as you've seen, we don't even have a, a concrete structure that we can compare and say this one is better than the other one. In the case of, uh, of the, the breaking down the EFT, are the various uh, swampland conjectures are giving you indication that you go there, but you know, some are half proven maybe of some of these conjectures, but then going from the conjecture to the actual theory, what do they really mean for the low energy? They're really far from that, but it could be a direction. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask that couple of questions, which is about, we don't know anything about the spectrum beyond the standard model spectrum. And then we might say that various degrees of freedom are integrated out, et cetera. But this is quite different from the situation where we have gravity because we know for sure that gravity does exist. And then we know that, you know, you cannot really define global charges, baryon lepton number. Then we say that we throw them into effective operators, a tower of operators. Now, how is this different from the ideas that you just presented today about swampland and emergent and so on? What is the it's, it's not I, different, right? What I was arguing, so I totally agree with you, first of all, I totally agree with you that we cannot throw away, gravity. that's the only thing that we cannot throw away out of all the uh, beyond the standard model of physics, right? And that is giving, you, is giving us uh, indication, that alone, because all the, all the indications again, the, against uh, the uh, continuation of this uh, symmetry paradigm is coming, one, from experiments, the lack of result from LHC, and two from gravity. Uh, everything else would tell you, and I was arguing that that is the case, that there should be new scales. And I still believe that that is the case. I mean, that I, I cannot prove it to you, but uh, you see that, uh, you know, neutrino masses, uh, inflation, uh, strong CP, uh, flavor, all these are sort of crying out saying, yes, there should be some other scale. It's very difficult to imagine that, first of all, that every, every solution comes from the, from the weak scale. I was arguing that is essentially impossible given, given all the information that we have at the weak scale. And also, I think it, is, it would be very odd if all these problems are only solved at the level of quantum gravity. Maybe, the, maybe that's the case, okay? There is this, this theory that boom, it gives you everything and, uh, and everything. I think it's very odd because uh, when you take uh, the, the standard model and you treat it as an effective field theory, you see that there is a logic. The neutrino masses, for instance, come out at a scale, which is not a Planck scale, and is exactly what, is, what indicates experiment. The axion it also will, it will tell you that scale. The, the, the implaton, right? If you take uh, the Kobe measurement and you use it as a normalization of the potential, you get a scale which is typically lower, significantly lower than the gut scale. So I think that we have a lot of indirect uh, evidence that there are intermediate scales. So this means, uh, you know, even if one goes, let's say, to the, to the multiverse, it doesn't mean that, oh, everything then is, is described by, by, by uh, probabilistic argument. Absolutely not, because we know already that many that the symmetries give some explanation. All I'm saying is that there will be now various criteria that come in, but probably this picture that we had that should exist one single final theory, which is the only logical possibility that I have some doubts that that is the case. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that there's no logic, okay? It just means that the story will be more complicated. And maybe, and I will, in the last lecture, I will talk about what I, what I feel, what would be the role of complexity in, the, in, the, in, in, in nature. Maybe we are facing now a regime in which we are going into complexity at uh, very low scale or very large scales. 
I, thanks for a very visionary talk, Jan. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to make one comment actually that this uh, Bekenstein Hawking formula for entropy, you know, entropy is basically uh, is a counting formula, which is a very low energy thing. And yet uh, that formula contains the Planck scale. So the, that's what you use, the IRUV connection there. But that formula originally came from effective field theory. I just wanted to make that comment, actually. And uh, perhaps it's a deeper understanding that uh, is going on for the last 30, 40 years. Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, perhaps might throw some more light on the IRUV connection. Actually, yeah. I'm not, uh, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not throwing out the, our understanding of effective field theory, which I think are a pillar of how to proceed. But again, maybe this is not a full story. Maybe there is something that escapes the effective field theory, that escapes reductionism, and, and it's embedded in the UV in a way that we will never understand simply by banging our head against the, 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 the IR. They, but you are absolutely correct, right? I mean, the, that bound is essentially coming from the fact that the Bekenstein formula is counting degrees of freedom telling you that there are on the surface. So they grow like a surface. If you instead forget about gravity, take a quantum field theory and count the degrees of freedom, the number of degrees of freedom grow like the volume. And so there is a different scaling of the two. And since you impose an, uh, 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 an inequality between the, the two contribution of the, of the entropy, at a certain point, you find an inequality also on the size of, the, of your box which is, uh, but that, in a sense, I think it is interesting. I mean, it, it comes from, a, from effective field theory, but it's a way of showing that, you know, everything that I use is an effective field theory. And yet I'm finding something that goes beyond. And uh, this, is, uh, this is why I wanted to show the example, not because I believe that necessarily is correct or is an explanation of the cosmological concept, but because it, it, it contains some elements that uh, are very suggestive that maybe something like that uh, can take, you know, take place at the fundamental level. Uh, yeah, so this is a question on the, when you give the example that we don't see Higgs, but we see the consequences of the Higgs. So yeah. as an experimentally, so the if multiverse hypothesis is like true. So in this sense, because they are beyond the horizon, in what sense can we ever hope of probing these uh, multiverses? Because by definition, they're not causally connected. Right. Well, I mean, of course, uh, there, there is a difference. In the case of the Higgs boson, you could imagine that uh, one day some uh, smart uh, engineer works out an electronic sensor to 10 to the minus 22, okay? But it's so extreme that for me, you know, something that is experimentally nearly impossible or something that is impossible in principle, for a physicist, I'm not a mathematician, for a physicist, there's very little difference for me. Uh, having said that, now let's go of what are the, the, the tests. Well, of course, you'll never see a signal beyond the, 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 the physical, the, the cosmic horizon. That is uh, now, there are some examples of, uh, of tests that have been suggested. And uh, one test is uh, the possibility that uh, there is a, a collision of bubbles in the, in the primordial times. And this collision would, uh, would leave marks in the CMB where there is a collision. The other possibility is that there are bubbles, when I talk bubbles, meaning universes inside the multiverse, that uh, uh, abort in the sense that uh, form a black hole and collapse. Also in that case, they would leave a mark in the CMB. And these are, are looked for by, by experimentalists. The problem, however, there, is that you have no guarantee that these things happen. Actually, if you look at, I mean, you don't know, you can't estimate the probability, but it's very, it's rather unlikely that you can do. So for me, the only, so let, let's aside these real uh, experimental tests. The, what, what I would view, and this is why I was giving the example of the Higgs, because I think that we have to use uh, uh, indirect, the consequences of the phenomena. We will not be able to, to observe the phenomenon, but we can observe the consequences <laughs> of the phenomenon. And, uh, and uh, you know, if, of course, we, we don't know the theory of inflation, we don't know the theory of the vacuum. 
if we had those things, so now we need the development you know, the theoretical front, but if we had those theories, then one could imagine making probabilistic prediction for various parameters, and then you can test those. And that would be an indirect, of course, you're not probing the multiverse, but you are, uh, you are seeing some indirect evidence that may uh, give you some trust on the ideas. In a, in a sense, it's like, uh, you know, like the quark, you're never gonna observe a quark, but you form uh, from, from measurement, you start forming a belief on, Q, on QCD, which is so strong that at that point, you also believe in all the consequences of, of QCD, even those consequences that you will never be able to observe uh, experimentally. This one is working. Nishita, you can ask your question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the talk. I just wanted to ask how seriously do you personally take the 500 GeV naturalness bound that you showed? And what do you think that means for the LHC strategy? Oh, I take it extremely seriously because it's, uh, it's a quantum field theory. Uh, there's no doubt uh, that the bound is what it is. Okay, this is uh, unquestionable. What is uh, questionable are what are the consequences of this of this bound? And I was uh, and I was uh, I was arguing that uh, we are facing an alternative. So either the Higgs works in the same way as uh, as the uh, the electron mass, uh, the pi on mass difference. Uh, the KK bar mass difference, and therefore we see new physics, or it works like the probably the cosmological constant and the story is different. But we don't know. But that number of the of the uh, for the for the bound of the Higgs on naturalness, there's nothing you can question. It's just uh, it's just math. Mm -hmm. No, I meant it uh, more specifically in the sense of actually seeing something new in an experiment. So perhaps I can put my question this way. Do you know of uh, working solutions uh, that are that we currently cannot design a search for or cannot be visible? Well, of course, you know, also the, the problem is that, uh, that the, the, the bound has uh, some... some uh, 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 some parametric uncertainty. So you, you will never be able completely, let's say, to rule out supersymmetry. You simply push it to larger and larger masses. Now, it, then it's up to you at a certain point to, to say, well, you know, the bound is so strong that I don't believe that that could be a, a real solution of, of naturalness. Now, of course, uh, as, you are, as you are hinting, there have been uh, uh, one, the LHC announced I didn't see any immediate uh, signals. More and more theorists have developed uh, models in which, which are harder to see experimentally because the signals uh, hide and it will take more luminosity to see it and so on. Uh, it is possible, but again, uh, the, the problem is that what are the advantages and disadvantages? I mean, do you believe that uh, adding epi epicycles is a solution, or instead you want to have a Copernican revolution and put the sun in the center? Uh, and uh, in a sense, we are facing that, and more and more we will face it. Of course, we will always uh, we will always be able to argue that uh, naturalness is solved by some uh, uh, some uh, some dynamics which is just beyond the corner. But uh, the experiments are doing quite a good job of, of cleaning up all the, all the space. Can I <clears throat> ask a sort of a natural continuation of this discussion? So to begin with first, thanks very much for giving this completely amazing uh, logical uh, presentation of the uh, Dilemma that I wanted to be provocative. No, it is it was really <laughs> wonderful. So first compliments. 
the question now i'm also going to ask some what provocative question so i think if i take all these discussions to their logical conclusions i really think that lhc is the last collider we should build that oh. is the question i have that because the your 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 3 kind of uh, uh, that, that you mentioned for the higgs will be realized by LHC at the end of you know when all of us would be under the ground but let's see would do it so then in that sense the if i follow the logic and which i find very mm -hmm. compelling uh, should we say that this is the last collider that we build? No, no, I, I, I don't. I, this is not my, my conclusion. Because uh, naturalness is one direction in a multidimensional space. Okay? I mean, it's not, it's certainly a fundamental question that we want to answer, but it's not the only question. Right? Uh, we, we used it uh, as a guiding principle to go towards the LHC for good reasons. I mean, we both <laughs> yeah. work so much on it that uh, for good reasons. So I, I, I really uh, defend the idea of presenting as a, as a one of the uh, essential element the LHC could see. But we all knew that uh, it was not a guaranteed discovery. And we also all know that uh, there are many open problems in particle physics. And Higgs natural is not the only one. And uh, while it, was, uh, it was a very good one because it was offering you a scale. While all the other problems are not telling you a scale, or in some cases, you're telling a scale that's unreachable. Uh, so that is a difficulty. But uh, if you look back in history, how many times uh, were big projects started with uh, a guaranteed discovery? Very rarely. And very often when there is a guaranteed discovery, then that experiment is not, uh, uh, is not a very great breakthrough, right? The, the, big, the big breakthrough were, were coming from something unexpected. And so uh, um, um, exploring nature at small scales is something that has always proven to be extremely useful. Oh, okay. We've been spoiled, I think, because you know we knew that the top uh, had to exist. And so we construct a Tevatron, sure enough, we discover the top. We know that the Higgs or something similar should exist. We discover, we, we build LHC and we discover it. So now we are in this mode that every for every collider, we should have the answer of what we are looking for. And uh, in the past, when they were, they, they, you know, in the 60s, in the 70s, when they were building a machine, they were not worrying about it. No, okay. So I can, I can actually argue for a 100 tail collider like this. But can I, since LHC would make, measure very accurately the Higgs and the top sector, do I really need the Higgs factory? They, I mean, if you look at, uh, I mean, it, it, I mean, again, I'm being, I'm being devil's advocate. I mean, I believe that Higgs factory will do something, but I want to. Get your perspective. No, that's why I was showing that uh, uh, that uh, the comparison about compositeness. I mean, wouldn't you be embarrassed to say, oh, the Higgs is an elementary particle? And then I tell you that you know that's an elementary particle worse than you know that the, you know, you'd be fooled to say that the pion is an elementary particle with the same precision. And it's kind of worse. That is a, is a, is a way of saying that our knowledge of the Higgs is really rudimentary. And after all, all the problems that we have of the standard model, all of them, really the conceptual problems, are linked to the Higgs. Exactly. Right? Flavor, we don't understand it. The possible instabilities of the vacuum and uh, nature, and so, they're all related to the Higgs. So that shows that knowing the nature of the Higgs looks something very useful, even if I cannot tell you, oh, you make that experiment, you're going to discover this because it has to exist, like we did it in the past. I, I think what I'm trying to say is that L wouldn't LHC tell me that much about the Higgs? Actually, that is the question that I'm really raising here. I mean, this is, it's a, it's a, because your 100 TV collider, I can justify, actually, I can understand your justification for that. I mean, after all, you and me and I even more, I've grown up in the times when colliders were just being built, not, you know, I mean, the SPP bares was built 
to look for W and Z. So I understand that. It's just that there is this, I mean, how strongly should we interpret the signals that we are getting from LHC? And this is for all of us as a community is what I am, because we have got spoiled. We have, you know, grown in the days of colliders. And question really is that, you know, these natural normal arguments we give about precision, E plus E minus following the precision of a hadronic collider, the LHC actually had bro broken many of those things. It has actually given us extremely precise measurements and experimentalists are even more and more confounding us with how they can achieve the precision. So my, to my mind, I don't know at this point where all the problems are associated with the Higgs is completely correct. And we might have solutions by studying the Higgs better. I am seriously not able to argue to a non-practitioner, mm -hmm. what would a Higgs factory bring more than the LHC will bring in the next 15 years? So first of all, the LHC program is not over. So, you know, we all, we all, we're all sort of implicitly assuming that there will be no discovery, but let's, let's wait, right? I mean, there could be, there could be another discovery and that's gonna change the picture completely uh, and the direction and the motivation. But I don't think we need to wait to have the full answer to, to understand that continuing the exploration is uh, something that is, uh, is important. I mean, every telescope that is proposed, they don't propose a telescope by saying, oh, look, with this, I'm going to measure exactly this kind of thing. They know that by going deeper in the sky, you are expanding your, your level of knowledge. And we are at that, at that level. In the case of, the, of the, the, the Higgs program, actually is the only one. This, so this, this argument would, be, would apply for the, uh, you know, the high energy exploration. In the case of the, the Higgs program is the only program that is really has a clear target. Now you may say, is that interesting or not? It's, it's impossible for us to tell at the moment. I think that no matter what result we're gonna get, we're gonna expand our knowledge significantly, right? And that is in itself important. And uh, since uh, we know that the Higgs really is, is, is the problematic particle, I think that measuring precisely is, uh, is uh, not only for sure will be an increase of knowledge, but is also likely to have some surprise there. I mean, it's, if you have to bet which particle you wanna test more precisely, that's the one, right? And so having a dedicated program uh, makes sense. Okay, let's, let's, very short question. Yeah. Uh, hello, yeah. Uh, I just have a very short question. Uh, earlier you pointed out that uh, uh, in extra dimensional scenarios, uh, these uh, scenarios suggest that uh, there are no large uh, scales beyond the weak scale. Uh, I mean, uh, that the fundamental Planck scale can be closer to the weak scale, right? Uh, I argue that for me, no. For me, there are intermediate scales. This is what I, what yeah. I would really do. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I, I mean, I have a question on the relevance of such scenarios. Uh, so, uh, as per my naive understanding, so this small separation comes about only when we look at the theory uh, uh, in the entire space time, right, uh, in, in the bulk. But uh, looking at the theory uh, in the uh, effective four dimensional reality, uh, we still have this large uh, Planck mass scale. And also uh, these uh, scenarios typically predict uh, new degrees of freedom that can be much heavier than the uh, standard model uh, particles. So does that somehow reinstate the relevance of such a scenario? Yeah, but I mean, if you're looking at a, at a warp, warp geometry, then clearly there is a, it's a case in which you have a separation. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, when I was talking about, uh, about uh, uh, um, uh, large extra dimensions. So in those, you really have to require that there's no separation of scale. And this is why for me, those theories, uh, uh, were, were, were dead even before they started to be explored in a sense, because they were extremely unlikely 
because they 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 could you know they they had this ambition of solving all problems at one scale, although you didn't have a you didn't have a theory. So I I'm arguing that uh, it would be very difficult to, to imagine that something like that can happen. And indeed, warped extra dimension does not fall into that category. Okay, because there is a separation of scale, and then you can also introduce intermediate scales by putting particles in the box. Thank you. Okay, we have to stop now and uh, let's thank Gian once again.